you that I never knew anything about Sharon Smith. She comes as a surprise to me. Um, she's lovely. Her work is just lovely. It reminds me a lot. There's a, a certain, not the style, but but what they say. There's a certain sameness about these teen single panel cartoons because um, um, Hilda Terry, who did a strip called Tina, and Marty Lynx, who, who did a strip called Bobby Socks, very similar. They all basically revolve around girls being cute and having boyfriends and being interested in boys. So they're, they're not exactly heavy, but the art is lovely. More examples. This is Marty Lynx I was just telling you about. Uh, the fact is, although the art is lovely in these, they're kind of shallow. This is much sweeter. They're sitting there talking about all the kids, the boys that they had crushes on since kindergarten. And it really is, it's very sweet. And she puts in here, in this panel, you know, she and a friend are talking about this. She puts in the mother listening and smiling, you know. And that's very nice. She's thinking basically, oh, those nice kids. Or maybe she's even remembering when she had crushes in kindergarten. Um, this is Dorothy, whoops, Dorothy Hughes. And there's a misprint here. It says that it's from the early 50s. It's actually from the 40s. Uh, because I know that because this is my strip. Uh, I have a lot of Dorothy Hughes. She was, it's, you know, it's amazing how you find these things. Some guy bought a whole bunch of Dorothy Hughes original strips at auction and sold them to me and that was really sweet and he didn't he didn't gouge me or anything he sold them basically for what he had paid and they're so sweet they're about these two twins and you can tell by what they're wearing you know this whole wacky rolled up jeans and everything that's a 1940s look more marty links marty links lived in san francisco she was great. I've met her, as you can see. She signed that for me. Again, this is an artist I was not familiar with, Becky. Very decorative, very pretty. Kato San was another one who did. This is cute, too, but I'm going to skip over it because I don't have that much to say about it. Um, Kato San also did basically the same kind of strips that Marty Lynx and Hilda Terry did and that, um, gosh, I've already forgotten her name, that first one, that Sharon something, what was her name? Um, this one? Yeah. Sharon Smith. Sharon Smith, great. Oh, Zitz. I have to tell you something about Zitz. I like Zitz and I hate it. I hate it. It infuriates me because he's such a horrible kid. He's completely ungrateful. He's sarcastic. He has no understanding and no respect for his parents. And personally, I would like them to practice tough love on him. I'd like them to throw him out and change their, their lock and, and see what real life, have him see what real life is all about. At the same time, I read it all the time because sometimes it's very funny. Luann. Luann is a much nicer strip. She's not at all like, like Jeremy and Zitz. Um, also, what is interesting about Greg Evans is that he has aged his characters. These are early Luann's, where she's 13 years old. He's aged them so that now they're in college. And um, he has respect for them. They're not obnoxious like Jeremy. They're nice kids. Oops, we go this way now. Thirteen going on eighteen. John Stanley. John Stanley was also the man who wrote and drew Little Lulu comics. Although Marge Buell Henderson was the creator of Little Lulu, she never drew the comic books. She drew Little Lulu cartoons in the Saturday Evening Post and 
she's famous for drawing Kleenex ads, little Lulu Kleenex ads. Um, in New York on Broadway, they used to have a gigantic billboard that was all worked out with electric lights, tiny little electric lights to make things move. I'm talking now about the 50s. And you would, sh you would see Tubby, who was Lulu's plump little friend. He would sneeze, all worked out with electric lights. And Lulu, who was holding a box of Kleenex, would take a, a, a tissue out and hand it to Tubby. And this was all done in little bitty electric lights. So John Stanley is brilliant. I mean, I don't know if anyone here has ever read the Little Lulu comics, the old Little Lulu comics. They're incredible. They're brilliant. They're funny. They're also very feminist because Little Lulu is a very smart kid. And the neighborhood boys, as you remember, had an upended crate that they had turned into a clubhouse. And it was a boys' club, and there were no girls allowed. But Little Lulu was always finding ways to get into that clubhouse. And she was smarter than the boys. 13 going on 18 is, a, it's not like Little Lulu, but it's also incredibly funny, incredibly well written. Um, people don't know as much about this comic, aren't as aware of it as they are of 13 going on 18, but I collect them. And because people aren't that aware of them, you can still get them comparatively cheaply. And I snap them up when I find them. <laughs> This is a comic I did in about 1986, 88. See, there's no title, there's no date on it. Um, for some reason, during the mid-80s, at least three women, including me, decided they would like to bring back the girls' comics. Because at this point, it was nothing for girls. It was just all superheroes and people punching each other out. And the editors kept saying, Girls don't read comics. Well, if you look at all those, you know that girls read comics. But they weren't reading comics then because they're not particularly fond of comics, of with starring guys with big chins punching each other out, right? Um, so we attempted. We attempted to bring back girls' comics. And this was one of the ones I attempted, California Girls. It ran for eight issues. But the problem was, at this point, the only place you could buy comics or comic book stores. Now in the old days, you know, when I was a kid, I would go to the corner candy store and get comics. There'd be a spinner wrap that said, hey kids, comics, right? Yeah. Um, or there's people I know who used to go to the, the local drugstore and get them. But at this point, in the 80s, and really now too, you could only get comics in comic book stores. And the comic book store owners were basically 30-year-old guys but inside, they were still 12-year-old boys. Yes. <laughs> and they didn't want to carry anything for girls. They just wanted to carry the stuff they liked, which was superheroes. Um, so all these beautiful comics, including mine, that we were attempting to do, um, basically died. I mean, this one ran for eight issues, which was pretty good. But they basically died from lack of distribution. Um, let's go to this one. Uh, this is Elizabeth Berube, Liz Berube. She was, by the early 70s, late 60s and early 70s, she was the last woman to draw for romance books. There had been, in the late 40s, you know, uh, mid to late 40s, there had been a number of women drawing for romance books. But slowly, and the thing about comic artists and comic writers is they weren't they weren't salaried they were all freelance so they weren't never really fired but the company simply stopped hiring them simply stopped giving them, them work but Liz was the last woman for, to draw for mainstream romance comics she drew for DC and look at her style it's gorgeous it's gorgeous it's so decorative, it's so beautiful. And I had commented earlier about how the men, when the men drew romance comics, they really, they had, you know, there were exceptions, but in general they had dismal understanding of women's clothes, you know? Um, Sydney has commented that, that they were always drawing women in ball gowns. <laughs> like, when did you last wear a ball gown? Um, 
So she was she was so great because she understood fashions. Melody, this one's from the 40s, and again it's from my collection. Um, it, there was only one issue, this issue, but Gil Fox was a popular cartoonist. He drew another strip called Torchy that was very cute. And I love talking about fashion. Look at, look at her seamed stockings and those cute little ballet shoes she's wearing. This one I was not familiar with. It's really interesting. Um, there's not exactly a story to this. It's just very psychedelic, but doesn't, doesn't, have a story, although it's very pretty. It's a very pretty page. Okay, we're coming to Patsy Walker. Patsy Walker, this again, this is one of mine. It's drawn by Al Hartley, who was awfully good. It's autographed by him. And, and you know, when I said talk about the guys who had no sense of fashion, some of them did, because that bathing suit is wonderful. <laughs> um, Patsy Walker started in 1944 in a magazine called Miss America. It was basically aimed at teenage girls. And in 1945, she got a comic book of her own. And the comic book, Patsy Walker Comics, was drawn by a woman, Ruth Atkinson, for the first year of its existence. A Canadian cartoonist who came to America and worked in America. And I was fortunate enough to meet her she was an amazing woman. She was very bohemian. After she retired from comics, she was making silver jewelry. Really, really talented. Um, these are all Patsy Walkers. Again, what I say about Al Hartley having a good sense of fashion. That swimsuit is great. I'd wear that swimsuit in a minute. <laughs> okay, this is Stan Goldberg. Um, the other big comic that, that Marvel was putting out in those days, really popular comic, was Millie the Model. And see, this is so great because you're nodding at everything I say. <laughs> <laughs> um, Millie the Model was, um, I think, actually Patsy Walker. No, I think Millie the Model lasted longer. I think Millie the Model lasted into the early 70s before they canceled it. Patsy Walker, I think, only lasted through the early 60s. Something for you to find out, Sydney, <laughs> since you researched this stuff. Um, one of the cool things about Millie the Model, again, fashion. Um, I love these, by the way. Stan Goldberg has a good sense of fashion, except, you know what? Because he's a guy, he doesn't understand the whole thing about paper dolls. You know, because girls would would cut out the fashions and the paper dolls and dress them. But you know what? Anyone who's ever played with paper dolls, there are no tabs. Yeah. You would have to cut out your own tabs when you cut them out. Otherwise, how can Chili wear them? Bill Wagen, Katie Keene. I think of all the teen comics of the late 40s and 50s and early 60s, I think Katie Keene was the most popular. Um, I belong, I take a couple of classes uh, that are senior classes, and at one point in the class, we were talking about the old comics we used to like when we were kids, and I said Katie Keene, and all the women in the class went, oh, Katie Keene! <laughs> <laughs> because it was, there was reader participation in this. Although there is in this also. Um, Millie the Model, the, the publishers and editors of Millie the Model, really got the idea from Katie Keene that they could ask readers to send in designs, and they would publish them and credit the readers. Um, this was the whole gimmick in Katie Keene that readers would send in designs, and they were always credited. Katie Keene was a model, just like Millie the model. Actually, she was a movie star, wasn't she? Yeah. Um, and that's her little sister, Sis. This is mine, too. A lot of this is from my collection. All right. This is from the 80s. Remember I said that there were at least three of us in the middle 80s who were trying to bring back girls' comics. Uh, that was me with California Girls. This was drawn by Barb Rausch. Now, Barb Rausch, but there's a lot of designs in here that I sent her, you see. 
credited to me. And look at that. That's so nice. They even have a little best wishes to me at the bottom. Uh, Barbara, I, I mentioned that, that kids used to send in designs for Katie Keene. Barb Roush used to send in designs for Katie Keene. And she sent in a lot, and they were printed, and she was like one of their star kid designers, teenage designers. And of course, when she grew up, she became a professional cartoonist, and this is what she wanted to do, you know, really repeating Katie Keene. And she even gives Bill Wagen, it's very sweet, because she gives Bill Wagen credit, even though I think he may have done some of the writing, but really the whole thing was Barb Roush. And the clothes are very 80s, aren't they? <laughs> oh, you know, I'm not as interested in this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Teen Titans, that's nice. That's nice that they had teenage heroines and superheroines, but it's not what girls liked. It's not what I liked. They're still, even the art, if you look at the art over there and compare it to the art here, there's a style that I call girl-friendly. Mm -hmm. And those things, they're girl-friendly. My God, Liz Ruby couldn't be more girl-friendly, you know? Mm -hmm. This isn't girl-friendly. This is there's something cold about it. Yeah. But boys like it. Let's get back to Archie. Mm -hmm. You know, I speak to a lot of women about comics, about girls' comics, about what they read when they were kids. Mm -hmm. A lot of them grew up on Archie because it was so available. But the funny thing is, they don't call it Archie. They say, oh, yeah, I used to read Betty and Veronica. <laughs> that's, that's who you relate to in Archie, not Archie himself. Bob Montana was the original Archie artist, and he, he defined the style that is still in use. That's the style. Here's more. This is another one of mine from my collection. I got the artist to sign it. Dan DiCarlo, after Bob Montana, who really defined the look of Archie, Dan DiCarlo just perfected it so that when you think of Archie, you may not even know who the artists are, but it's Dan DiCarlo's style that you're looking at, that you're thinking about. And again, you know, these guys had a great sense of fashion. She's wearing these nice skinny crop top, crop pants. This is a whole Archie comic. And who is the artist? Harry Lucy. Actually, I'm not familiar with this artist, but he's working in the accepted Archie style, as you can see. These two are also from my collection. And they are Dan DiCarlo, who I think... Although Bob Montana defined the style, I think the best one was Dan DiCarlo. After Dan DiCarlo left, Stan Goldberg took over, and he worked in that similar style. Stan Goldberg also drew Millie the model. He was very good at what I call the girl-friendly style. This is nice. Um, Dan Parent is is still working for Archie Comics. Um, and it's nice to see something that's just penciled and not inked. And it's pretty, this would be so easy to ink. He's even showing you how the figures in the foreground have heavy outlines so they stand out. That's for the inker to know. More, I think these are, okay, these are actually two artists I'm not familiar with again. But again, working, working in the accepted style. Yeah. I think we've just done it. Does anyone have questions? Someone must have a question. Come on. I think there's one more wall action. Which wall? Uh, I think that it's manga. You know, I just commented that it was, for the longest time, it was nothing but guys with big chins punching each other out. And girls didn't like it. That's not what girls like. And so the editors and publishers could say girls don't read comics. But meanwhile in Japan, they were turning out comics for boys and comics for girls. Shoujo manga and, um, what's the other name? 
Shoujo and... Shonen. Shonen, thank you. Shoujo was for girls, Shonen was for boys. And they're great. They're great. And again, what I said about fashions, the girls wear great clothes. The girls have adventures. Um, just really, really nice stuff. And what happened was the first comic really to, from Japan to hit America's sh shores was Sailor Moon. And that was a shoujo manga. And girls loved it. Girls loved it. And soon other mangas followed shoujo and shonen. And you could no longer say that girls don't read comics because girls were reading these comics because you could, this is like the early 20th, 21st century now. You could go into the big chain stores and go to the manga section and you'd see girls just sitting on the floor surrounded by these comics reading them. You couldn't say girls don't read comics. So, you know, it was really shoujo that changed the course of American comics. Because now there are comics for men, comics for women, comics for boys and girls, and so much more to read. And they're so good. Hi, Kim. Hi. <laughs> okay, I think that is it. Although this is really nice. I'm not familiar with her. This is the Emerging Artist Showcase. And again, the art is lovely. It's charming. It's what I call girl-friendly. Now, do we have any questions? Yes. I was wondering if you could comment on Sabrina. Yeah. Was there a Sabrina page? No, there's, there's a comic the in the case. Oh, oh, yes. yeah, okay. Sabrina the Teenage Wolf well, Witch. It's, it's an art. Judy, I have Teen. I have Kathy. I think I have a copy of Scooter. Here we are. And this is a recent one, too, isn't it? Well, not recent. that recent. <laughs> Define recent. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not the 50s or 60s. Like, this is totally 60s. You just have but to look at it. It screams 60s at you. Probably actually 1970. Uh, Sabrina's, again, look at that style. That's the same style. I was talking about Bob Montana and uh, Dan DiCarlo. That's the same style. That's the quintessential Archie Comics style, really. Too bad they don't have any originals. And this was pretty wacky. This was... <laughs> I have some of those. <laughs> <laughs> this was from, I believe, the 60s, late 60s, um, about a teenager becoming president of the United States. He'd probably do a better job than what we have now. So. <laughs> I brought this for you to sign, but maybe you want to say something about this? Oh, well, it has oh. nothing to do with teen comics at all, except that all girls loved Wonder Woman. Mm -hmm. And um, I did this in the middle 80s. Um, and I did it in the style of the original Wonder Woman artist, Harry G. Peter. That was what I wanted to do because to me, Harry G. Peter represents Wonder Woman. He defined her the way Bob Montana defined Betty and Veronica and Archie. Here, take it back and I'll sign it. Okay. More questions. So would you say that fashion is what makes it girl friendly or is there something else? Fashion is one of the things that makes it girl friendly. There's a look about it. There's a kind of a softness about girl friendly style. Um, a roundness and a softness. Whereas if you look at the superhero style, it's very angular. You know, it's not, both, in both cases, the artists know how to draw, but they have such different styles. This is, I, very, to me, it's very cold, and it's very angular, whereas girls' comics are soft, they're warm, they're, I'm trying to find a perfect defining word. I find them harsh. And harsh. Hard to follow. Harsh is good. They're harsh. Yes. And hard to follow. These are much easier to follow. That's good. Harsh and soft. Someone else? You've worked on a lot of manga projects. Yes, right? I did. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about in, uh, in the um, early 20th, 1st century, I, um, for about a year, 
I was rewriting manga for Viz. Uh, what they do is, you know, it comes from Japan and Japanese. They have it translated, usually by a Japanese exchange student who translates it literally. You know, and they have to do better. Yeah, I mean, that's you cannot imagine what, what some of these translations were like. You know, and then I would get it, and I would turn it into readable English. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, it was also funny. I mean, trying to figure out what they were, what the translators were saying. Like there was one um, where she's talking about the girl who wears prom roses, and I thought, well, those are special roses that you wear to your prom, until I realized they were primroses. <laughs> or there was one with a villain who, who dressed up like a rabbit. He had a rabbit mask, and the, the, the direct translation was something like crazy rabbit man. Well, that's not particularly scary. So I changed, I changed his name to white rabbit. So that was fun. That was fun because I could get pretty creative. Not rewriting the story, obviously, but creative in many ways. And I really enjoyed it. And also because I would get them issue by issue. And I'd get the one issue to, to rewrite. And then, you know, when it was time, I'd get the next issue. So I was following the stories. You know, it was like, oh my God, what happens next? Did you ever have to call the translator and go, what? <laughs> Never. Really? Never. Mm -hmm. I could figure it out myself. Great. Like prom roses. <laughs> Took me a while. What, what do you think about the recent um, TV shows that are like so centered on these comics, like the Riverdale and Sabrina? And I have to admit that I really haven't watched them, but I think it's a good idea. I think it kind of counters all those extremely action-filled and sometimes awfully violent superhero movies. I mean, you know, at the time when they were saying girls don't read comics because there was no comic for girls, there were also no comics for kids anymore in those days. It was terrible. I mean, I would, you know, if I had a, a, a young child, I would not let them read some of those superhero comics, which were very violent. More questions? Raymond, you must have a question. No, 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 I, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> well, this might seem kind of far afield, but I saw a presentation at a conference recently where a guy was talking about communism and romance comics and the way that, like, different political things show up, like, sort of in the themes, you know, like, he was talking about one comic where, say, the, the um, woman fell in love with the spy and had to be converted. Oh, there were some stuff. of those there were some of those really nice ones in I think the early seventies where uh, I remember one where she's a she's a counter spy. Yeah. And she's you know she she entices these guys who are bad guys who are in, you know the enemy mm -hmm. and you know kind of basically seduces them and then turns them over to to the authorities. But then she meets a guy, and he supposedly is a bad guy too, but she falls in love with him, and uh-oh, that's what she did. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, yeah, subliminal so messages sort of about, like, social... Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, uh, you know, in general, they were not very political. But every now and then, you would get a comic that really said something, because those are the outstanding ones. I remember one from the 50s, and the 50s really... I think that the late 40s and 50s were the, the golden age of romance comics. That's when they were at their best. Um, there was one that was really amazing, um, where the heroine uh, is offered a job at, overseas at, for UNESCO. And my goodness, UNESCO, really? And they're all telling her, her father says, no, don't go, you know. <laughs> and her boyfriend says, oh, if you go, we're through because, you know, I'll lose you. And she goes anyway. And and guess what happens? She meets a guy who works for UNESCO, and they, they live happily ever after in London. I mean, that was very unusual for a love comic. What do you look for when you're collecting art? I look for art I like. 
all those pages that are part of my collection are because I like them. Your collection starts in like the 1890s or something? Uh -huh. No? Not quite. I wish. No. <laughs> um, I mean, I was able to find the very first comic drawn by a woman, and that's by Rose O'Neill, and it's 1896, but it's not an original. It's the magazine. I don't have anything that early. What's the oldest one you have? Uh, probably the teens, um, Nell Brinkley art mm. from the teens. Oh no, I also have a great cartoon by Faye King from about 1912. Huh? That's, by the way, those who believed that women didn't draw comics in those days, they did. And there were quite a few of them. And it was not considered something that only boys did. Everyone read these comics. But they were not in comic books. This is pre-comic book. They ran in newspapers. the date of that Dolly Doodle. You know, it's pretty early. Yes, you're right. It's even earlier than the Fay King. I think it could be from like 1911. Early 1911, maybe even earlier than the teens, maybe the the tens or the aughts. Yes, I have a Dolly Dimple by um, by Grace Drayton, who also co uh, created the Campbell Kids and drew these adorable little kids who all looked like the Campbell Kids in fact. Um, and in fact, Campbell Soup, when they gave her the contract to design the Campbell Kids, they wanted her to sign something saying she would never draw that for anyone else, but she couldn't sign it. She refused to sign it because all her kids looked like the Campbell Kids. Uh, she was amazing. And these women were very successful. That's the other thing. It isn't just like, oh yeah, one woman drew a comic in 1907. No, there were lots of them and they were very successful. They were household names. Anyone else? If there is no one else, I'm signing copies of my most recent book up front. Um, it's called Babes in Arms, and it's about the women who drew comics during World War II, who drew comic books during World War II. Because what happened as in every other industry during the war, was the guys went off to fight. And suddenly they were hiring women because they needed to hire someone to turn out these comics, just like they needed someone to turn out the ships and, and planes and you know, work in the factories. So suddenly you had more women drawing comic books, not comic uh, strips, there'd always been women doing comic strips, but comic books, thank you, than ever before. And what I do is I, I have picked the four women that I think were the best of the, they were all good, but the four women who were the best of the bunch and written about them and reprinted their comics in. So I'm going to the front. Thank you.